All right, thank you all so much for being here. Today I'm going to talk to you about why animal fats are good for you. Now that's not what we usually hear about animal fats, right? What do, what do we usually hear about animal fats? Yeah, they're going to kill you, right? I think if we look back over how our diets have changed over the course of the 20th century, we'll find that there are few driving factors that we could identify that have had such a profound influence over this transition uh, than this idea that animal fats are going to kill you. Because this idea that animal fats are bad for you has led us not only to abandon certain nutrient-dense animal foods that are important to human health, but it's also led us to embrace in their place food products that are rich not in nutrients, but are rich in refined flour, are rich in refined sugar and vegetable oils. But before we get into all of that, I'd like to provide a foundation of what I would see as common sense, or what should be our common sense, about the role of animal fats in human nutrition. And in order to begin laying that foundation, I think we need to go back to the work of this particular man. Does anyone know who this is? Right, this, this is Weston Price. And Weston Price was the first research director for the American Dental Association, a position that he held for 25 years while he conducted animal experiments and clinical research and other laboratory work studying the causes of tooth decay and the role of tooth decay in human health. And after he uh, completed this position, he moved on to produce an epic work of nutrition, nutritional anthropology called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. And in this work, he documented the consistent effects of the transition from traditional diets to modern refined foods in numerous groups on every inhabited continent, except with the single exception of Asia, to which he was unable to travel until the second, uh, before the onset of the Second World War. And in every case, he documented that when groups were on their traditional diets, regardless of their genetics, regardless of their geography, regardless of whether they were hunter-gatherers or they were pastoralists relying on herding cattle, or they were agriculturalists, on their traditional diets, they had vibrant health. And he was especially interested in dental health, but he, his documentation went beyond dental health. So he documented very well that they had a uh, very broad and well-developed facial structure, very wide dental palates that had room for all of their teeth, immunity to tooth decay. But he also documented that they had freedom from tuberculosis, regardless of their living conditions. And he documented with moderate evidence that they had freedom from cancer. And others after him also studied such groups on their traditional diets and showed that they were free of heart disease and other degenerative diseases that are very important to us today. While on the other hand, as modern foods came in, consistently there was this transition of not only diet, but of health, where there was loss of immunity to tooth decay. There was loss of this well-developed facial structure and perfect dental palate. And there was loss of immunity to tuberculosis, immunity to cancer, immunity to heart disease, and all of these other degenerative diseases. And if we look at the diets of all of these groups uh, who were healthy, who had their vibrant health on their traditional diets, we see a lot of variation. Not every group was eating the same thing. In fact, they were eating very different foods. And if we were to compile all of those foods onto one list, we could identify this list that I've shown on the screen as the primary foods that were uh, within the menu, within the spectrum of traditional diets. And that includes the large and small animals of the land and sea, the organs, bones, and the skin of animals, dairy products, including the butter fat, eggs, whole cereal grains, tubers, coconut, fruits, and vegetables. Despite this diversity of traditional diets, the modern di diets were all basically the same, and they were centered on what Price identified as the displacing foods of modern commerce. White flour, white sugar, white rice, syrups, jams, canned goods, and vegetable oils. And you can see from this list that with the sole exception of vegetable oils, most of these foods are very rich in carbohydrate. 
And Price was aware of this and he acknowledged this. And although he was not an advocate of carbohydrate restriction per se, he did say that we should reduce the carbo carbohydrate content of the diet to what he called the normal levels found in natural foods. Because he did acknowledge that as you uh, have this nutritional transition in general, you do get an increase in carbohydrate content. But carbohydrate content was not Price's particular concern. He was mostly interested in nutrient density. And he was especially interested in the fat-soluble vitamins. And this wasn't because he thought that fat-soluble vitamins were more important than water-soluble vitamins or minerals or any other nutrient. But it was because he realized that fat-soluble vitamins are not distributed very evenly in the food supply. And they can be very difficult to obtain because they're only found in certain foods. And he identified as a key characteristic of all of the successful groups he studied who were thriving on their native diets that those groups placed special emphasis on procuring foods that were rich in fat-soluble vitamins. And he divided these foods into four categories. Seafood, meaning the animal life of the sea, fish and shellfish. Organ meats and eggs. Dairy, including the butter fat. And the small animals and insects. And not every group ate all of these categories of foods, but they all ate at least one of these categories, and some of them ate two or more of these categories. So they all obtained fat-soluble nutrients from some source. And if we look at this list of foods, we can see that some of these foods are very rich quantity-wise in animal fat. For example, dairy. More specifically, the butter fat is where the fat-soluble vitamins are. Butter fat is an animal fat. Eggs are very rich in animal fat because they're a very fatty animal product. On the other hand, we have foods like shellfish or liver. Liver uh, is, both of these are very low in fat and very nutrient dense. So liver, for example, is a phenomenal source of fat soluble vitamins, but it's very low in total fat. However, that nutrition in the liver is found in this very small quantity of unusually and incredibly nutrient-dense animal fat. So regardless of whether these foods are high in fat or low in fat, they owe their nutrient density to their content of animal fat. And why should this surprise us? Animal fats are the best sources of the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, the best source of choline, the best sources of essential fatty acids. And it's not just their nutrient content itself, but the presence of fat in the diet increases the absorption of fat-soluble nutrients from other foods. To, so take, for example, this human study where volunteers were fed uh, apples fortified with vitamin E, with a bagel, I know you don't like the bagel, but the bagel had either no fat added to it or low fat cream cheese or high fat cream cheese. And you can see plotted here the entry of vitamin E into the blood over time. And as time progresses, you see a peak in, uh, the, vit excuse me, in the vitamin E content of the blood. And you can see on the bottom is the, uh, the meal that had no added fat. In the middle is the meal with the low fat cream cheese, and on the top is the meal with the high fat cream cheese. So the more fat you eat, the more fat soluble vitamins you absorb, even if those fat soluble vitamins are coming from other food. Even if they're coming from vegetables in your salad, the more fat that you have in the meal, the more fat soluble nutrients you absorb. So we can say a few things so far about animal fats. They were an important part of traditional diets associated with vibrant health. That's one thing. They were displaced during the modern nutritional transition by food products rich in refined flour, refined sugar, and vegetable oils. They are important sources of fat-soluble nutrients, and they increase the absorption of fat-soluble nutrients from other foods. So, so far, uh, would we say animal fats are looking pretty good or looking not, not so good? Yeah, they're looking pretty good, right? So you would think that they'd be saying that animal fats, at least in some contexts, are pretty good for you. But it, we said at the beginning that that's not what we hear, right? No. So what, what do we hear? Yeah, they're going to clog your arteries, right. 